perspective. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our moderator today and uh, Shuzu Ho, who is the Associate Dean for uh, UCIP, where she works on academic integration and programming. Um, in addition to working with UCAP directly, uh, Shuzu has been a professor of UCSB for over 30 years. So welcome, Shuzu. Hi. Can you hear me and see me all right, Elizabeth? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, it is my great pleasure and delight to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Kumkum Bhavnani. Professor Bhavnani received her bachelor's degree from the University of Bristol in England, her master's in child educational psychology from the University of Nottingham, and her PhD in social and political sciences from King's College University of Cambridge. Dr. Bhavnani is currently distinguished professor of sociology at UCSB and also has affiliated faculty status in women's studies in the global and international program and chairs the minor in women, culture, and third world development. Kumkum has assumed numerous leadership positions at the UC and I won't mention but a few of them and these include the vice chair and chair of the USB Academic Senate followed then by the vice chair and chair of the UC system-wide Senate. She has also served as the chair of the UC system-wide University Committee on International Education. And this is the Senate committee that provides academic oversight for UCEAP. Kumkum has had a long standing relationship with the UCSB EAP and UCEAP. She was active in student selection for UCEAP and served as the London Study Center Director uh, from 2008 to 2010. Dr. Bhavnani continues her commitment to international education in her current role as UCSB's Associate Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement and the Senior International Officer. Professor Bhavnani's scholarly and teaching interests with graduates and undergraduates include globalization, women and international development, cultural studies, and critical social psychology, for which she has received a number of teaching and mentorship awards. In addition to writing numerous books and articles, Kumkum is also a filmmaker. Kumkum's 2006 feature documentary, The Shape of Water, spans three continents and tells the stories of women confronting destructive development with a passion for change. Nothing Like Chocolate reveals the story of an anarchist chocolate maker living in the rainforest of Granada who creates world-renowned chocolate sustainably and ethically. Luta centers on Santa Barbara's first licensed female architect, Luta Ria Riggs. And then We Are Galapagos spotlights the conservation strategies fostered by some of the island's 30,000 inhabitants, and it premiered at the 2018 Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Kumkum will thrill us with more today. I asked Kumkum, what is something about you that most people don't know? And her response was her passion for ballroom dancing that she took up for two years before producing the short documentary, You Think You Can't Dance? which premiered at the 2019 Santa Barbara International Film Festival. In her talk today titled A Conversation with Sociology in the 21st Century, Professor Bhavnani will discuss her sociological research on gender and globalization and treat us to extracts from several of her documents. So please let's give her our virtual UCAP <laughs> welcome. Woohoo! You can do your uh, hands clap and whatever. <laughs> Welcome, Kum Kum. Thanks so much, Shuzu. Um, I don't know if people can see me. Is the screen yep. yes, showing the introduction? Yes. We're okay. good. We're good. Okay, great. Um, because all I see is the the. Okay. Okay. In. I really want to thank all of you um, for all that you have done for me. UCEAP has been a, a, 
a, a stalwart for me. Uh, my time in London as study center director was life changing. And uh, I particularly, of course, want to thank UCEAP, including Vivian. Uh, I'd like to thank Elizabeth Pearls for this talk. Um, Shuzu, who has been my colleague forever and uh, a, a real true friend. And for today, I especially want to thank Bryn, Bryn Lemon, who is doing all the technical work and thank goodness I'm not. So uh, anything that goes wrong is of course my fault because I won't have told her enough um, about what, um, sorry, my screen's gone funny, about what to do. So let me just talk a little bit about myself and my intellectual passions. In the 30 years since coming to the sociology department at UCSB, it's a department in which I have a really true intellectual home. My scholarly passions continue to shift from critical social developmental psychology to race, racism, ethnicity in the US imaginary, to the lived experiences of women in the third world, all of which are inflected by my feminist thinking, academic and political. These moves have ensured that my interdisciplinary commitments continue to be realized. My PhD was interdisciplinary. Because now that I'm an ac academic in third world and development studies, I have to engage with economics, politics, literature, culture, in addition to sociology and psychology. And that was something that was very joyful for me. And as I started to teach about women in the third world, I came to see that novels could allow students to develop more intimate understandings of women's everyday lives. I found novels like um, Paula Marshall's The Chosen Place, The Timeless People, a novel that we all should read, I think. Um, and Liana Bather's Balcony Over the Fakihani. These novels were critical in allowing people to get closer to the lives of people in areas and experiences that we have not experienced. And yet I was unable to find films that offered the same insights. And as we started to enter the 21st century, I realized how important films were. I was looking for films that presented women's realities because of teaching about women, culture and development. As the realities of those who are both experiencing hardship and joy, pleasure and sorrow, of course, but as simultaneously women who are active in the creation of a more equal world. They have agency. That's what I was looking for. I wanted films that drew on feminist lenses, subtly, and I wanted narrative structures so that the films are more engaging. And finally, I wanted films in which one could see how social justice is realized by the women themselves. I couldn't find such a film. And the story of how I decided to make this film is a bit longer than uh, we have time for. But I just want to say that when I couldn't find such films, I decided I would make them myself. And that's what I started 15 years ago. Films and filmmaking that start the basis of my conversations with sociology in the 21st century. For me, interdisciplinarity is a sine qua non when thinking about sociology. That interdisciplinarity led to me becoming the inaugural editor for Meridians, for example, in, at the turn of the century. And I define sociology as the study of inequality and how to ameliorate inequality. And when we think about that, it only takes a second to realize that we must be interdisciplinary. My conversations with sociology, and I want to stress not my department who have supported me in my work all the way, as are many others in the UCSB communities. So my conversations with sociology are also more than simply looking at inequalities and ameliorating. While we analyze inequalities, and while sociology talks about mixed methods as always desirable as we conduct our analyses, 
must the filmmaking be part of the mixed methods approach? In France, cinematic sociology is an intriguing development, and it forms a recognition that the digital impact upon our everyday life also extends to our scholarly lives in a very profound way. The best way to present my argument is to present is to show some clips from my documentaries. So let me do that and let me talk a little bit in between. The Shape of Water was my first film. Yes, not the one that won the Oscar, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I love that film by Guillermo del Torres, but someone in his team stole my title. Uh, but never mind. Mine was called The Shape of Water in 2006. And it centered on women's love of life and political change. It looked at women creating social justice in Senegal by eliminating female genital mutilation. In Brazil, by protecting the rainforest, the forest dwellers and others who were doing that. In Jerusalem, I spent time with women in black uh, who opposed the occupation and also with Mizrahi feminists who have their own discussions within women in black. In India, I filmed women in the Self-Employed Women's Association. Some of you may know about that. At that time, it was uh, 700,000 strong. It's a union for women run as a collective. And we can talk more about that, SEWA, S-E-W-A. And I looked at also some women who are opposing the building of a dam in the Himalayas. When we look at film clip number one, Bryn, if you could pull that up, we're looking, uh, it's just a short clip to show you how the women are working to resolve some of these problems. It's from the trailer. It's not great quality because we were using mini DVs in that, at that period in time. So just bear with it and go with it if you don't mind. Go take it away, Bryn. to village and saying we know that it is dangerous and we now know why and therefore we must stop and we must stop together derrubada e chegamos lá encontramos os peões né conversamos com eles já desceu motosserra da sede da fazenda Encontramos foi os, os policiais mandados do governo, logo deu ordem de prisão para gente e nós pacificamente nós ia cantando o hino nacional, né? I think the reason we're perceived as being so extremist is because we're women. What does it matter if a woman has a point of view? Avazdo! Amiga! Avazdo! Amiga! I'm very pleased that uh, people take seriously what we say we stopped being ignored. I realized that we needed a place, a place which was like a sanctuary where people could come, could meet, could reflect, could assess. The movement Navdanya has really been built since 1987, beginning with saving seeds, creating community seed banks to defend the rights of communities to their seeds. It is about conserving biodiversity in agriculture. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to stop there for a second because I wanted to mention that Molly Melching, uh, the woman who's speaking now about FGM was not in the final film, Kadi Kaota was, um, so that you knew that things progress as we make films. We first work with some people and then we work with others. And Bryn, if you can pull up the second clip now, uh, let's see what you think of that. Learning how to be citizens of the earth, not just consumers in a global marketplace. But there is another globalization that is at work and that is the globalization of citizens connecting to each other. It is a people's globalization, a globalization of resistance. It is the women who are in the forefront and they are the ones who have to pay the price for the destruction of life and life support systems. But also because they are part of another economy, another world, another thinking which puts life for profits.
point of the documentary to show that women right around the world do things that uh, contribute to a globalization from below. As you can see, my documentary films are integral to my academic work. The, I don't, can't even remember how many pages of transcripts we had, how many I had, how many interviews we did, um, and so on and so forth. And my films are also informed by Usman Semben, who's the Senegalese filmmaker, late Usman Semben, who said that people often do not have the time to pause on the details of their daily lives but the filmmaker can link one detail to another to put a story together. That's my goal. Of course, making documentaries differs from academic work. Written scholarship offers a depth of explicit analysis and context that is often impossible to achieve with documentary film unless uh, some think it too long or, and, but we've all watched documentaries that are four or five hours, which are brilliant. But that's not the standard. Um, and while that is the case about scholarly work, that it's a depth of analysis and context, documentary film allows audiences to witness dialogues and relationships amongst people. The look in the eye, the sideways glance, to understand institutions and cultures through the lived experiences of people in a very unique way. What documentaries do are able to illustrate the immediacy of people's lives with an intensity and texture that the academic printed word seldom can accomplish. And I will say the academic word. Um, of course, novels can often do that, but um, academic writing is not known for its uh, engaging qualities, if you like. For me, film is a way to depict culture in action. It's not to dismiss scholarly written work, not at all. How could I? I am an academic after all. I had a book come out last fall, so on and so forth. The making of a film documentary demands research always that ultimately brings the subject, the issue, the topic, the people more directly into view. Of course, I'm well aware that filmmaking is artwork and fieldwork, and my love for ethnography never seems to leave me. Thought about my history, my first book was called Talking Politics. And in that book, I argued that politics is about ways to make change at individual level or at the level of the state and all the ways in between. And for me, Scholarly work is also about politics. How can we think about change? How can we imagine political change in our own settings? So if uh, uh, you could show the next film clip, uh, Bryn, from Nothing Like Chocolate, that would be great. Who doesn't love chocolate? But there's more to this decadent product than we know. Most of us eat industrial chocolate produced by large chocolate companies who get their cocoa beans from all over the world. Much of this cocoa comes from Ivory Coast in West Africa, where there is a history of using child slave labor to harvest the beans. This cloud of child slavery has haunted the chocolate industry for many decades. But in the Caribbean, on the island of Grenada, the chocolate revolution has begun. Thank you. This film, Nothing Like Chocolate, Shuzu mentioned in her introduction, um, has a number of aspects to it. And again, I can perhaps talk about how I was drawn into the topic. But the central character in the film, as well as chocolate, I have to say, as well as ethical sustainability, is Mott Green, 
Mott was an anarchist chocolate maker living in Grenada in the Caribbean who made chocolate ethically from tree to bar after he learned about children being trafficked and enslaved to harvest cacao in Ivory Coast. Next clip, please. The beginning of this project was inspired by the horror that goes on with chocolate. So much cocoa grown in the Ivory Coast is dependent on child slave labor. In 2001, it was found that children were being trafficked to participate in cocoa harvests in Ivory Coast. It's a particular scandal that it seems to be growing. The scale of slavery in the 21st century seems to be getting larger. I'm glad to be doing something exactly the opposite. I started this chocolate project as a result of living in Grenada for years and the idea of revolutionizing the connection between cocoa farmers and the finished product. So what we're doing here is roasting cocoa beans. I break the bean under my nose and I smell the gases that come out when I first break it. It was certainly a motive. Um, we follow the story of one farmer, Nalise Stewart, who is actually the star of the film. And she wonders whether to join the collective or not. And what I'd like to do now is to ask Bryn to play both clips, clips five and six, uh, following each other, please. And then I'll, say, I'll comment some more. Thanks, Bryn. I've been growing cocoa about 30 years now. I like to grow everything. Cocoa, nutmeg, banana, citrus, everything I love. Everything I love on farms. Organic farm. We are not walking. Things in the land are slow, you know. Based on the economical crisis, drug loss, you know, people are frustrated. Awesome. It is very delicious. Sour. <coughs> you enjoy harvesting the land? Weeding the ground? No, I'm not a farmer, I'm a housewife. You're a housewife? I'm doing those things. Oh, you're supposed to use children, you're supposed to help in the land. We the ground. This is where I will get, I will leave him from. But I don't like it. Why you don't like it? Because that's for you, old people. So you saw that. Um, actually finding clips to show for this talk has shown me how much more editing we could have done on the films. So, it's through the least and Mott Green that we're able to imagine how to change the horrors of chocolate harvesting. They both work together with the cooperative to create delicious chocolate. It's really delicious. And the horrors of chocolate harvesting caused by Cargill and other such uh, multinationals they are the real cause of why farmers in West Africa are forced to use zinc uh, children to harvest their cocoa beans. So that's also something that I always want to remember, that it's not that the farmers in Ivory Coast are bad people. It's that we're embedded in a system that forces them to work in particular ways. That's where the sociology comes in. We make documentaries, we integrate our own, my own standpoint into the work. That's not just from the questions I ask in interviews, I can talk about that, but also through the B-roll, the other shots that are available, the shots that I select, how I represent the interviewees and their words, which stories to tell, and many of the techniques essential for filmmaking, lighting, camera angles, use of sound. So a film is not 
just the true words, the authentic words of the people in the documentary, although I will claim mine are, because it's much more than that, because I have made the selections. I have made some decisions about what stories to tell. By the way, my crew comprises of three people and me. Um, so when I talk about the crew, it's, you know, four of us. Um, and it's a cinematographer, Sky Borgman. Um, who, uh, the sound is done by Ashok Ghosh, who lives in England. Uh, you should know, I disclose this to every person who gives me a grant, every grant body, who is my nephew, who works in sound with the BBC and other organizations in England and comes and does this with me. And uh, a techie guy who uh, transfers the film that we've shot uh, onto our hard drives. So documentary film is, presents stories, presents words, but we always remember that these are edited. And I just want to remind myself of that all the time, even though I like to think I am being true to the people and the issues that I present. Shudu mentioned Luta. And um, in 2014, it premiered at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. The documentary explores the life of Luta Maria Riggs, who died, who lived from 1896 to 1984. She died on International Women's Day. She was one of the first women in California to be named a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Bryn, could we have the next clip up, please, number seven? This is from Luther, that film. The subject of light and architecture is a, an essential subject because architecture is only revealed with light. Form and shape are revealed by light. What's interesting, if you think of Luda as a person who was a loner and a quiet person and an inwardly looking person, but being an architect and an artist looking at a number of her buildings, you're outside when you're inside and there's Thank you. So light was a feature of her work. And I think that of course speaks to aspects of people's lives and inequalities that we can discuss later. Public architecture was one of Luta Maria Riggs' strengths. She designed the iconic Lobero Theatre in Santa Barbara. And if we can have that next clip up, that would be great, Bryn. She always optimized oh, sorry. the magic. I'm sorry. Uh, my apologies, Bryn, I changed something. Can I have the clip after this now and then have this one after that? So clip nine now, please. That's very likely, I can never prove it, very possibly, that's the way she designed the stage house on the low barrel, that she started from the street and went up and got all the way to the cornice on the top of the building which is, as you know, is one of the spectacular architectural achievements in Santa Barbara, or really anywhere. It's a wonderful thing. But I can almost imagine Luda just doing that from the ground up. Thank you. Um, uh, apologies, it's, it's my fault. She also, though, even though public architecture was uh, keen interest of hers. She also created residential homes, homes that are quite startling uh, for, in many aspects. So can we have film clip number eight now, please? That's the Claudia Lapin clip, please, Bryn. I don't know if that makes sense Always to you. Always optimized the majesty of the site and she wedded her building to the site in a way that could be considered a signature. 
she had the ability to position a building such that it created intimacy within a context of majesty. That's a very difficult feat to pull off. However, if you visit her buildings, you will notice immediately the intimacy and the warmth in an eminently livable space. Her homes fit the people for whom she worked with them. She would do things, as Melinda Gandara says in the film, like sit down with people, which wasn't common for architects to do in those days, and say, how do you like to eat your breakfast? Do you like the sun coming in, or do you like a little bit of shadow? And so on and so forth. She took the lived experiences of people very seriously and understood that homes are places where we have to be able to relax. Luther was deeply uninterested in her own personal appearance. She never combed her hair. She publicly explained she was not married when the uh, people on the building sites would talk, refer to her as Mrs. Riggs. They thought it was a courtesy to call her Mrs. She would say, I am Miss Riggs. I have never been married and I never intend to be. Um, she also got on very well with the people who worked on the buildings. I interviewed some of them and they described how she was one of the few architects who talked to them as equals. So when they said, Miss Riggs, I don't think this electrical something or the other can happen. She'd say, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Let's leave it till tomorrow. And the next day she would come and she'd say, for example, to Stan, Stan, I've just been thinking, what about if, and then she had designed a new way to do the electrical so that it was possible. No put down, nothing. Just a straightforward colleague to colleague. And of course, they appreciated that very much. Could we have film clip number 10 now, please, Bryn? I think more than anything, her meaning to me is simply that she was an individualist. She was not to be dissuaded. She was not to be tamed or pushed around, but she was very practical. And that's the huge significance to me in the model. Who was the real Luda? The real Luda was maybe something that nobody could ever really pin down. This elusive artistic nature that she was hiding or protecting. She was definitely in search of the magic of her art the magic of her art. She did not care about her appearance at all. Yet she created the gorgeous Vedanta temple in Santa Barbara. When she was invited, the nuns told me in an interview, when she was invited to design such a structure, she told the Swami she had no interest in doing so, as she had never been in a place of worship that she liked. To which he replied, well, now you must build one that you do like. The final clip from Luther uh, shows just a shot of the Vedanta temple and uh, how she designed and, some, and Claudia commenting on her. So take it away, Bryn, clip number 11. That was the house, the Vedanta temple. She was a pioneer. There's sort of this joy and whimsy in how she drew and designed. I think that her wonderful sketches and renderings are what first told me that she was an artist putting architecture on the ground, not just completing buildings. Thank you. I know it's always a little abrupt when a clip ends because I didn't pay attention to um, the music and so on. The editors I work with would be having a heart attack if they saw what I'd done. So you get a feel for the film and uh, you get much more in that about Luther and who she was. In 
2018, We Are Galapagos screened at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. I'm always interested in how we can imagine change, architecture, sustainability, creating social justice. And I made the film because I wanted to show that it is the people who live on the islands, 25,000 of them, who look after the animals and the landscape, who make sure that they are protected and who try to mitigate the impact of climate change wherever we live. The way I got the idea for the film actually was I was going on a school trip with my daughter who was going with her high school um, to the Galapagos. And she came home one day and looked me very firmly in the eye and said, mom, we need one more person. Parents are okay, otherwise we can't go. This is what we do. So off I went um, to, on this trip. And as we were flying from Guayaquil to, into the Galapagos Islands, we looked down and my daughter said to me, she said, mom, I didn't realize there are so many people living here. Look at the houses. And I had seen the houses and it had never struck me that we don't think about the people. And that got me going about this film. Um, and what we'll do now, Bryn, it's, it's number 12, and it's the full trailer. It's a minute and a half or something so that you get a feel for the film. Take it away. They are islands teeming with wildlife. Stunning diversity and natural wonders. People think of the Galapagos and they think of iguanas, colorful crabs, and the sea lions. But they don't realize that there are people there in the Galapagos. Hola, me say no. Eh, vivo en el barrio Bellavita, Galapagos. It's a community where scarcity is everywhere. There is no fresh water. Most of the food comes from the mainland. An adaptation is everything. The main source of economy is the tourism business. This is my greenhouse. Everything is for our consumption. And if they don't find a way to survive. Bueno, mi vida mía ha sido muy complicada. Antes de no me alcanza hasta que le paguen a mi esposo, no me alcanza el dinero. Neither will the Galapagos. <laughs> Please don't do this. No, 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 pero es que es prohibido hacer eso. Que vaya a través de la policía. We need to keep the balance with the ecosystem. It's a mixture of people all living together. Que se hizo el primer aeropuerto ecológico a nivel mundial. If we're really serious about charting a sustainable future for a place like Galapagos, we need to act now. We are. We are Galápagos. Thank you. You can see the music worked well there. Um, and our very own Doug McCauley is featured in the film. I, in fact, I forgot to tell Doug I was doing the talk, but never mind. Um, and so we are Galápagos. I just started a documentary for which I've received a substantial grant, but can't uh, utilize it at the moment because of the pandemic, called Science for Nuns and Monks. 20 years ago, His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama, initiated a project for Tibetan Buddhist monastics, nuns and monks, to acquire scientific knowledge, especially astrophysics, because Buddhism talks about the nature of the world, and neuroscience, because Buddhism talks about consciousness, topics that are central to our lives. I see this as part of sociology. We need to understand where the material and the spiritual, where they collide or meld. I've been given access to make the film. Um, uh, it demands filming in India, which, uh, as you know, the tragedy of India now, um, it brings tears to our eyes, um, means that I, I won't be going there for a little while. I'd like to show you some bits from the trailer. 
And then I'll check in with Shuzu about time um, and, you know, whether I have another hour to speak. Just kidding. Or not. But let's look at these clips. Um, poor old Bryn got the clips only this morning and they go one after the other. Uh, we don't have to, I don't, I won't speak in between them. So take it away, Bryn, and do your best. To bed from ever since they were monks. But, but, but the can, you pause it? can you pause it a second? Can we start right from the beginning? Because she says nuns have been, thanks. There were Tibetan nuns in Tibet from ever since they were monks. The nuns never had any system of education even in the free Tibet. Fossil fuels are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and that's the part that humans are affecting. The monks and nuns are natural leaders. So the leaders must be well versed both in Buddhism and modern knowledge, including science. The world. And also, I think it will uh, develop our cleverness. Also, I think, and I like that. So, Buddhism teaches you to discover the happiness in being simple. If science also pays attention to this and say, comfortable, but this much is good enough, then maybe we have a better future. And absolutely, Buddhism can help scientists to be a better human being. If they are better human beings, if they are not envious, if they don't just want their own glory, what is important that we as a human race feel compassion for each other and progress together. Again, the choppiness is my fault because I can't edit, so I couldn't put the clips together. Actually, we haven't experienced much contradiction. We just have to think about it. We just have to research it. And science itself is just like that. The real empowerment has to be given to the person inwardly and has to come from inside. Thank you. Bryn, uh, first, I, I wonder if we could have a round of applause for Bryn, who, um, I don't know, she just deserved everything that anyone can give her. So thank you, Bryn, and uh, maybe we'll see your face as well sometime. <laughs> now you're not doing this. Brilliantly done, brilliantly, thank you. Uh, Shuzu, time. You want me to stop now? Do, can I say two sentences? Oh, can please, I speak please, for another you know, three minutes? Tell, of course. Tell me. Uh, you have three, five minutes if you'd like, and then we can open it for questions. Okay. So film is a form of politics, and the question becomes, what form of politics can move us towards a more just world? Alvin Ailey said, dance is for everybody. I believe that the dance came from the people, and it should always be delivered back to the people. Dancing is hard work. It is the way by which people learn subtle moves and thoughts. It is demanding, and it is about passion. Krishnamurti said that. Film, dancing, passion. The present era marks a period of realignments in the cultural and political economies of the world, as we can see in Brexit, 
in the January 6th riots in the US and in the criminal failure of nation states to work together to mitigate environmental degradation. And here there's, we're not saying anything about the contradictions around Burma, the issues at the border of the US with Mexico, and so much more. I have mentioned India. These are all issues that have brought together a number of constituencies, however, that were previously quite distinct. Black Lives Matter in the United States and the Arab Spring uh, 10 years ago in this decade have brought to the fore the extent of state violence that will be used to ensure that class, racialized, and gendered hierarchies and inequalities are maintained. It's clear that we live in times that are filled with contradictions. When we think about rural Bangladesh, we see that women's economic independence is, appears to be only possible through obtaining bank loans so that they can make handicrafts to sell to tourists. And we can talk about that. Lesbian and gay groups are subject to increasing restrictions and monitoring, including in Latin America. And yet more people are prepared to engage in open protest against many of these measures. In Southeast Asia, throughout the Americas, as well as in Europe, sex work has become a site for discussions about the interconnections amongst women's work, women's agency in doing this work, tourism, militarism, migration, masculinity. Contestation, tension, and power paradox organize our world organize our lives. Borrowing from two writers, I see the world as, and I quote, stooping to pick up the golden apples dropped from the tree of industry and to barter truth, love, and honor for traffic in wool, beetroot sugar, and potato spirits. Might I suggest that all of us who are scholars, academicians, who work in universities in many other roles. Might I suggest that we bring our minds to bear to ensure that truth, love, and honor do not continue to be bartered. Is it possible to dance the passionate dance of political change for social justice? We urgently need to. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Kunkum, on your impressive body of scholarly and creative work. And thank you for enlightening us with the film Extracts, your extraordinary and insightful storytelling. What a treasure of glimpses of various sociocultural issues that you've shared with all of us today. And I should note that a number of the documentaries are award-winning and I, I, I failed to mention that. Um, I see that there are, uh, we have nine minutes and I see that there are a few questions. Um, I'm just gonna read one comment uh, from Virginie. She says, I will always remember Kum Kum the day she presented Muhammad Yunus at a UCSB lecture. This man is a Bangladesh economist, best known as the founder of the grassroots Grameen Bank, a financial institution that provides small loans to poor people without any collateral. I have two questions here. Um, Just before you go into those questions, Shuzu, yeah. let me yeah. tell you something about Mohammed Yunus. He came into my class the day before. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. It was a three hour seminar with undergraduates and um, came in and he asked me to call him Mohammed because I'd been calling him Dr. Yunus. So uh -huh. I said, Mohammed, you know, this is the group we're going to introduce ourselves. And we all discussed your book last week at length. So we're all ready with questions. Uh -huh. And he just looked at me and he said, oh, my goodness, I think I'm ready to run away from the critiques you all <laughs> will have. So he always had a sense of uh, the impact of his work. All right. Right. So Kathy um, Carol Crowther, she would like to know at the, uh, if these films that um, you've shown extracts are available to view in their entirety anywhere. Right. Shape of Water is on Canopy. I mean, the UCSB library has all of them, but Shape of Water is on Canopy. Um, Nothing Like Chocolate is uh, 
you know, if you buy it for an educational institution, not UCSB, because I'm giving UCSB obviously three copies, but um, then would you buy it through um, whatever they're called? Uh, I've forgotten the name of the educational distributor, but um, otherwise, let me whisper it to you. I heard that you can just get it on the internet without paying. So <laughs> don't tell my educational distributor, but um, you know, so you can find it somewhere. And if you can't just email me, uh, the others, Luta uh, is not available. Um, I don't own it. I was commissioned to make it. So it, you mm. have to go to the Luta Maria Riggs Society website and work from there. Galapagos, just text me, you know, email me and I'll send you a link to it. Um, premiered in 2018 and later on that year I was going up north for two or three years so I didn't do much with Galapagos uh, in terms of making it widely available so please just I've got a nice little the editor did a nice one for home video you know for your computer web and what was and then the 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 trailers are all should be public um, and I think that's it oh and the ballroom dancing one uh -huh. I just made that as a piece of whimsy. So please just email me and I'll send you a link. I I've done I'll nothing just, with it. I'll just pop yeah, in print, and say, I we'll send a follow-up email with any links to any films that are available to anyone who wants to see them. Um, also, there are no additional meetings on this account after the fact. So we can just go a few minutes over just so you know, Shuzu. There's no time pressing. Okay, okay mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, Michael Bordeaux um, would asks, please explain the system that hampers the Ivory Coast chocolate growers and how the Grenadans escaped it. Um, okay, so 40% of the world's cocoa is grown in Ivory Coast and Ghana. In, uh, that cocoa is bought up uh, as mass by Cargill and others. I'm afraid I can't quite remember. The film has the names of some of the um, multinationals. These multinationals insist on certain prices for the cocoa, very low. Ghana has avoided some of that because Ghana has a system of cooperatives for a lot of the agriculture and certainly around cocoa. So cocoa is grown in Ghana in uh, uh, farmers' cooperatives, and so they're in a stronger position to argue about the price. Ivory Coast, that is not the case. The politics of the country, the sad uh, ways in which the country has had to deal with its colonial legacy means that farmers work very individually. And where what we have there, therefore, is that farmers at Ivory Coast are getting very little money. They have to harvest the cocoa. Remember, 40% of the world's cocoa comes from Ivory Coast and Ghana, but a lot of it from so 20, 30%, maybe 40, yeah, comes from Ivory Coast. And so they have to produce and they have to, you know, harvest things at certain times and so on and so forth. So they use children and there are, uh, dreadful stories about children being harassed and then kidnapped and forced to do this work um, so that it can happen. It's dreadful and the film goes into it in quite a lot of detail. Um, so it's something we should do something about and where we start perhaps is buying ethically produced chocolate. And the thing about Grenada is it's a very small island, you know, population 100,000, 150,000. You will know of the revolution in Grenada and how the U.S. stopped it um, in the 1980s. And uh, Grenada, at the time that Mott Green started to think about chocolate and making it on the island, Grenada didn't make chocolate. You know, that wasn't one of its exports. And so he was the first. And in fact, in the trailer, in the, yes, the trailer, you see the prime minister talk of Grenada at the time talking about how Mott has put Grenada on the map. So 
Mott went in with the determination to do it right, hence the cooperative, hence this, hence that, they all make decisions together and so on. Mott passed away um, a few years ago through an, an accident, he was fixing something, I can talk about the sailboats and so on, to have the chocolate delivered so the environment wasn't harmed, anyway he was fixing something on that, fell off, his companion had, was, had gone outside for two minutes, suddenly realised he couldn't hear Mott, Mott had fallen back onto a concrete floor, um, knocked himself out, and then because it was electrics, the two electrical wires landed on his chest and gave him a heart attack. Um, it's just one of those dreadful, dreadful things. I was going to Grenada, in fact, to celebrate the premiere of the film. Mott and I had been talking about chocolate, champagne, this, that, and the other, you know, what, how are we going to do it? how we're going to make it light and fun and so on and dancing. And um, I went instead to his memorial. Hmm. So it's sad, but he, but that's how it, Grenada avoided it. He got support from the government as well to do it in this way. Does that help? Thank you. Um, Phoebe Juarez asks, well, says, love your work. And I believe this is a question she would like to have some tips for a Mexican trans woman who wants to make documentaries in a community that might not be accepting. And if I could insert when you ask, uh, answer this specific question, you know, maybe also um, provide some insight about the types of funding and grants and maybe foundations that you've been successful with. Yeah. Sure. Um, first thing to say, Phoebe, please, please, please get in touch. Let's talk about it because there were places where I wasn't welcome to start with. And it's, it ha it's not being manipulative. That's what I want to be clear about. It's not being manipulative. Uh, people say, what are you doing? What are you about? And as you explain, people understand. So let's talk about it. Um, and thank you for your kind words. I had support actually for Shape of Water. I got $5,000 from Academic Senate those many years ago. And I leveraged that to going with a cinematographer. She just graduated and a friend of mine who's a director and a filmmaker uh, in Wellesley said, Rochelle will go with you. She'll go for the adventure. We went to Senegal and Jerusalem. I mean, on $5,000 and, you know, did a ton of filming, which actually a lot of it, her filming was great, but we decided not to use some of it. Um, so I got grants from the Academic Senate. So I'm eternally grateful to UCSB and I'm eternally grateful to the Senate. And my way sometimes of doing that, to say thank you is to give back to the Senate. Um, I've also had grants like the Ford Foundation gave me a grant to finish editing Shape because it's editing that costs Okay, I can get the crew, you heard. They come for almost no money. You know, they come because they believe in the project. But the editing, you have to pay the editors because the crew comes when they don't have other work. You know, they're all working freelance. So the editors need the money. So that's where you need the money. And um, I got a grant from Ford and I want to thank Melvin Oliver, who in his first year at UCSB helped me with that process. And um, I've had grants from film sort of places, oh, not chicken and egg, but another one, something that supports advocacy in film work, you know, that sort of thing, uh, a place from Stanford that gives you money only for your second film, not for your first, and never for any after that, you know, I mean, it's great, and you just have to... Because I'm not a full-time filmmaker, I have to do it on the side. And so, again, I'm very grateful to people. And this last grant, it's the first time I've had a grant where I haven't had to scrabble for money. Mm -hmm. I've done two shoots in India, made these trailers. Templeton decided they would support me. It's, it's always never enough, but really a long way towards finishing the film except the final edits. Um, and I can't go to India. It just seems so unfair, doesn't it? Yeah. So UCSB figures large in my life in many ways, including supporting my filmmaking. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can squeeze in these two final questions, all right? So from Julia Burkhead, um, you mentioned that filmmaking is a form of political speech because of 
how you choose to edit and the resulting story you tell. How do you begin the process of learning the full nuanced story so that you can make an intentional and responsible choice about the story you will tell? What a great question. <laughs> Want to come and work with me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So I thought, okay, we're going to do. So, how do you begin this process of yes. learning? Right. This. Yeah. Um. Okay. You could not. Well, you one can. You know, I make documentary films in two ways. Either you know the stories and you go to get them, right? And that's what Shape of Water was. Shape of Water emerged because students in my class, I was saying, I was banging on about, oh, women in the third world have agency, you know, West is not best, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, give us some examples. Sure, Chipko, uh, a movement in India of women saving trees in the Himalayas. And uh, they said, that's from the 1970s. And your point is, but anyway, I did lots of research and found these organizations and what women were doing, because I wanted it through organizations and so on, taught about it in classes. So it was the students who pushed me. I was actually writing a grant. I was pushing and pulling an all-nighter for, for a MacArthur grant to write a book about uh, what Shape of Water is about. And as I was writing the book, I thought, oh, no one's going to read this. And it's really, it could be interesting. Um, and I decided I'd just make a film. And there's more to tell about that because an editor, a very um, eminent editor who was helping me, editors of documentary editors are very generous. So how do you choose your story? You can either go and capture them. And this editor said things to me that I could tell you later. She just thought, she said, you're mad. You know, in that time, she said, you're going to a place, no money. You don't speak the languages. You're going to five different countries around the world. And then you want the stories all melded in you know not chapter one chapter two anyway i got what i wanted and i felt if i can do that then i can make a film so you could either capture and i put that in inverted commas stories or you can go and see what happens i knew about chocolate because i read an article which started take a piece of chocolate by two journalists take a piece of chocolate put it on your tongue let it melt savor those flavors is it what is it that je ne sais quoi of chocolate and then the next line is could it be the taste of slavery that got me going and um so i was interested in making a film now my philosophy is that we should know about the problems in the world but my philosophy in filmmaking is to see how people are overcoming problems at an individual level, at a national level, at whatever levels. And so I thought I don't want to make only, only again in inverted commas, a film about uh, children who are maltreated. And that's an understatement in the Ivory Coast. Um, I want to say, what can we do about it? What, what, you know, how can audiences imagine something different? And so, just looking everywhere, everywhere, everywhere for ethical chocolate. And then I bumped into Mott through the internet and Mott never stopped talking. And he became a very close friend. And at first, if you see the trailer, you'll see that he talks about some of the difficulties. And at first he would refuse to talk about the difficulties. Uh, he wanted it all to be funny, you know, his whole project. And I tried, I explained to him why. And that's where uh, Phoebe's question, I explained to him why it's more interesting if people talk about some of the things they've overcome. And um, so we get some insights into Mott that are really lovely. You know, he slept in the workroom. Anyway, whatever, you got an insight into this man. And with Nalise, I got the same, you know, that's where I captured, got, filmed her daughter talking about it's for old people, this work that you do. So, you can either capture stories you know about, or you can go knowing you want to do something around ethical production of chocolate and you don't know what. And as I talked to Mott and as we went to Grenada, I thought, we need a farmer. So, you know, I know some people in Grenada, anyway, some women's organizations, they introduced me to Mrs. Stewart and she was happy to be involved. And so we went that way and Mott got someone else for his collective, someone who didn't know anything about it. So you can either go and get the stories you know, or 
You have some idea and then you see where it leads you. And I will tell you that your editors can be very fierce. You say, I want to make a sweet and happy story about making chocolate sustainably. And they say, no way. Please go and get some footage where we can see some of the challenges, some of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So editors help a lot. Did that answer the question at all? Uh, if Terrifically. Not, <laughs> Kum Kum, you're such a gem. Um, I think probably Bryn, right? This is a, a, a we should stop here. Um, there are a few more questions and I can see that those questions would take you another at least five, 15 minutes to answer. And I know you need to go as well. So thank you so much. There are many, many comments here. Brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. You're amazing. This is wonderful. I mean, yes, truly, truly a gem. So thank you for your extraordinary um, storytelling abilities and, you know, bringing these sociocultural issues to us um, with, you know, global issues, gender issues. Um, thank you so much. My pleasure. And now you see why you see EAP is at the heart of my life as well. <laughs> and once again, thank you to Shuzu as always and Vivian and to Bryn. Just <laughs> Bryn is the one you want when you're doing complicated. <laughs> she thank charges $5,000 an hour. By the way. <laughs> thank you so much. We'll be sending a follow up email to everyone who attended today. Thank you so much for being in the audience. And we will CC Kum Kum on that if you have any follow up questions that you'd like to address to her directly. So Wonderful. thank you, Elizabeth. Bye, thank everyone. You. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. This was Bye. so successful. Thank you again, Kum Kum. Bye. <laughs>